Okay, so we are back. Certainly for one of the last interviews of the night. Thanks for staying around. Uh, you'll have these ones on demand and ways. And for this last one, we have Blog with us. Thanks for stopping by. Good to see you. Good to see you too. What are you? What are you doing? Uh, I am a general manager for Tribe AI. We are a, a I like the name, by the way. Tribe AI is pretty cool. I like this. Uh, Tribe Vibe, baby. Uh, <laughs> We're an AI native services company. We work with uh, mid to large enterprises to deliver AI products and solutions in matter. Okay. Uh, I got first got into IoT working in the renewable energy industry. Okay. Uh, so I started my career uh, solar panels, looking at monitoring systems and looking all of those things up. I started to see the power that data has. Uh, from there, I started working in an AI company. And it was 2016, almost 10 years ago now, okay. uh, here in Austin. And, and I remember back then, uh, there was IoT platforms everywhere. Yeah. Uh, like everyone was trying to be the IoT, IoT platform. platform you know, yeah, tell me about it. PTC <laughs> and some of those are still around today. Um, but uh, for us, we were working with a lot of really large large companies to do a lot of like experimentation type stuff. And then it was it was more of your traditional machine learning automated model building, uh, anomaly detection. The natural language processing was more like help me complete this sentence or yeah. help me understand what's in this document. Um, but very high level. Um, I at that point I saw that this was a goal. And it was like, oh we're working with massive companies. Here and, and they are still all trying to figure it out. For me, that then led me to wanting to figure out where I can sell picks and shovels. And uh, I spent the last six prior to joining Tribe, I spent six years working for AWS selling cloud services, understanding you know, how people essentially build their houses on the internet, right? And, and, and develop and deploy these applications that we goes into that. Uh, 2022, we had the, the chat GPT moment yep. that came across and, and you know, kind of brought me back to like, oh, look, where we have all of these great tools and you know, AWS is essentially like going to you know, Azure. It's like going to like a Home Depot. You can buy all these things to, to build what you want, but at the end of the day, you still need someone to build it. Yep, yep. Um, <clears throat> that's what led me to wanting to seek out, hey, how can I get more on the build side, right? Uh, 90% of tech is hype, 10% of it is, is, is the stuff that, you know, mostly system integrators and consulting companies and innovative R&D departments build. Um, they think it's shown at nice fancy yep. demos. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so now working at Tribe, there's some common trends or things that I've noticed uh, that I wanted to talk to you about and, and get your thoughts and opinions on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I published this blog post earlier today. Called, you know, when ML companies grow up to be AI organizations. Okay. And a trend that I have noticed yeah. is particularly working with machine companies that have well established machine learning practices uh -huh. is uh, they don't really see how generative AI could apply to their business. Because often it doesn't. <laughs> and, yeah, and I've heard that sentiment here today too. I've heard in talking to people here that, like, uh, you know, Generative AI maybe isn't accurate or it isn't, it isn't helping me. You know, the, the two traps that I think I see people fall into is the it's not accurate enough for me trap, uh, yeah, yeah. decision trap. Yeah. Why, would I, why would I risk hallucination? Yeah. Um, or the uh, enhance an existing process trap, right? I have this process that I do. It would be great if, if yeah. AI could do this process yeah. for me. Yeah. I would say the third trap, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, given what I do, is the let's wait and see trap. Like, everything's moving really fast. Let me, let me yeah, figure let out. Me, let me do nothing. Yeah, I hear you. I actually share the same sentiment that, well, actually, I think there's some confusion happening with the buzzword AI. Right. First, to start with. Right. ML is not something new. It's like machine learning, bringing specific mathematic concepts to solve solutions based on like lots of input and resolving problems is something that that is not new generative ai came in really strong it, from the buzz perspective like with very impressive demos and applications and and the word ai became what word ai became gen ai yeah and so and the problem has been that everyone to be relevant needs to put AI in their name, whatever. And so the ML companies you're mentioning, they're doing a great job at, at putting together 
algorithms to do anomaly detection, you know, predictive maintenance, things that are really useful. Yeah. Vibration, you know, analytics for detecting an object in its movement, falling, whatever. Well, this round things, right? Cramming that into microprocessor to make that processor like microprocessor smarter. Like these companies have been around for some time, but now they need to put that AI word because that's what they need to do. So people have been more confused. But I like your 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 saying of like they're coming from an ML company becoming an AI one. They're just adopting the word AI and and I think it's more than that, right? Is it? That, uh, what you need to think about is okay. And, and I think a lot of people had this ChatGPT moment, right? Like. The first time they went in and they typed it and it was like, oh, wow, like this actually feels really natural. What yeah. what does Jenny actually do is it exposes these technical endpoints. So all of these like anomaly detection and um, risk models and everything yeah, yeah. like that, it still requires someone with expertise yeah, true. to like go and analyze and look at the graphs and look at those charts and like figure out the regression model. And what, what did Jenny I do? It made it so like, oh, maybe I can ask this question and put it on and, it. Yeah. Okay. As as a, is it fair to say that Gen AI could be the the HMI for data? Yeah. The, the human interface machine. The, oh yeah. Uh, human machine interface HMI, right? So, absolutely. I mean, it's really yeah. You know, I mean, data is a very good thing to buy it up and say. Um, for us at Tribe AI, like when we originally started working in 2019 and all we do is AI, it was a lot of uh, predictive, uh, predictive maintenance and anomaly detection type yeah, yeah. use cases. I'm working, I've been working with companies today and like an example of a uh, uh, company that I was working with, they built all these very amazing computer vision models. Uh, they built one to do solar analysis. They've done one to do shade analysis. They built a model to detect the whole total roof yeah. area. They, yeah. they built a model to detect uh, the amount of shade that that roof might get, uh, or the number of like uh, crevices that it might have. I'm yeah, missing yeah. the yeah. missing yeah. specific yeah. term. Yeah. Yeah. But I see you mean. Uh, and so they have all the, you know, for them it was like, why? Why would we need Gen AI? Like, I don't need, I don't need to use generative AI to tell me how many chimneys are on that roof. Yeah. Yeah. Like I have a model that can tell me that. Yeah. Which, and, and it, that's where I think a lot of these companies are missing a point is that all of those models that you built, those are essentially tools that are in the tool belt. What is the actual question you're trying to answer or that this company is trying to answer yeah, yeah. with this imagery data? It's, uh, is the, has the property tax assessment changed on this house? Uh, how, is this a good house for putting solar on? Um, what's the third one that they... You basically combine... You, you're going to use Gen AI to combine the insights that these other models are, are extracting from raw data and they're specialized to extract specific insights from the specific data sets. And Gen AI could help you correlate all of that. Oh, this, give is the, you, yeah. this is the big change, I think, that happened with DeepSeek that might have gotten overlooked by where it actually came from, yeah. uh, was this idea of like thinking out loud and reasoning and, and reasoning models. ChatGPT came out, or OpenAI came out with their reasoning model, uh, which actually like, at that up to that point, it was all about speed and like how quickly yeah, yeah, yeah. have response. And I think that's where a lot of people have gotten this misconception that Gen AI is inaccurate isn't for me, because like at the end of the day, it's gonna tell you kind of what you want to hear, but the reasoning models actually stopped thought and would think through the different ways that they would solve it. They would break a problem down. They would analyze what tools or what things I would need to solve this, and then go back and run kind of multiple pathways to figure out what is actually the best answer, and also help keep those things on track. Yeah, yeah. By using these machines, by using, by thinking of Gen AI more as this orchestration layer, and, and, and of this master, yeah, yeah. master craftsman, as I refer to it, uh, you're allowing it to ground itself in those precise models yes. and those precise capabilities. Makes sense. You just kind of like get above that level of like, I'm looking at this for this specific piece of data. And it's like one higher level question. What is the actual like value of yeah. that? Yeah, interesting, interesting. And so you, there's a term you've been using like early on in the conversation, like before we're live, that was interesting to me, which is, how do you not take risks? So what are the risks that you're taking when you're 
onboarding on the AGI backend, trying to trying to figure out what the scenario is for using AGI. What are the risks that you're facing and how do you minimize it? Yeah, I think for us, we have some models that we kind of use. I think a, a general guiding principle is just think big, start small, set yourself up to scale fast. Um, I, I often will prompt companies to think about their business in 20 years. Uh, you know, or ten years. Yeah. But like, what is your, what is your, what is the future of your business, and what does it look like? And maybe think back ten years ago to what this yeah. was and how that was evolved. Um, and it's easier to have a much bigger vision and find a small place to start. Yeah. Than to like find that you know, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could summarize this piece of text and, sum it, 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 and do this thing? Like, yeah. yeah. Summarization is probably one tool in the toolkit of a, of a broader like, agent type yeah, based architecture. Yeah, totally, totally. And then I think that, uh, yeah, starting very specific with those specific tasks and thinking about what are the tools that I'm going to build. And then once you start to look into what, what it is you're actually starting to try to accomplish, then you want to and start thinking about agents, you still want to try to keep those very narrow and keep the, the tools that they're using all within one orchestration. Where I see some companies start to fall apart is they introduce complexity too quickly, right? I want to have all of these models kind of talking to one another. And, and that makes it really hard once you, know, you introduce a new variable. Like, you don't know how all these things they are fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> One level above, they can basically say, I know what tools I need to use to solve this. But you're making it too much because of like, how you're seeing kind of like edge AI kind of like bifurcate into different uh, types of AI, right? yeah. yeah, different, yeah. different edge points, right? And those all kind of serve a different course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, what I was describing is, is this notion that the, the edge is taking different types of shapes, different sizes. But they are not independent of each other. Where and you and you bring different types of AI, or sizes of AI, or more or less specialized models on these different types of edges. When you think about a microcontroller, let, let me go all the way down to a motion sensor. Now you can bring AI all the way down to the sensor itself to not just send the the actual you know gyroscope data, but to send the I'm falling, you know I'm I'm walking, I'm on a car. And that's the kind of emission that sensor will be able to set. And then you look at the intermediate edge device that will be maybe a bit richer, connected to different smart sensors, collecting these different insights, making some determination, eventually have some level of uh, you know, automation down there. Uh, and it could be about driving a vehicle you know, around obstacles, something like that. And then you have heavy edge, what I would call heavy edge, where, where you're bringing Part of the cloud compute and capabilities on premise, not on a device, but most likely on a rack of servers, okay. yeah. where you still own the data, you, you guarantee privacy, yeah. you guarantee latency as well. When you have these heavier models that usually run in the cloud, run down there, or at least a portion of them, maybe some of these large language models applied at that level on the factory floor, in on premises, not depending on the connectivity to the cloud. And then eventually you have the cloud part, which I see becoming more and more relevant in gathering data after or before normalization, and then being it like doing its role as big data management. Like you have infinite storage, you can shove it and correlate with a bunch of different sources and then make something out of that. But it's like it's something where you, you, you can see now, you know, how the different edges combined with the cloud could make sense if we're able to bring the edge, the type of edge AI they need in the right places to deal with the data that is down there. Does it make yeah. sense? Yeah, so I mean, we're both uh, X hyperscalers, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, why would you not send everything to the cloud? I, well, as the hyperscaler, I would ask this question. And, and, but on the other side of the story, it's well, people that. are just like, why would I yeah, yeah. <laughs> send the data? And, and you know, interestingly, I'm, I'm working with a customer I cannot name right now. They, they are operating, you know, their machines in like hundreds of factories across the world. Different systems, like different SCADA systems, PLCs, whatever. And, and they're trying to understand why they have so much downtime. And so, yeah, yeah. Downtime, right? And so they're just like, 
trying to figure out, but they were thinking about the complexity of having to adapt some sort of edge AI, whatever, and bring it down there versus collecting as much data as possible and shoving it up there for making sense of it. And I think there's going to be a middle ground. There's going to be this notion of how much of that data will have to be normalized, unified, filtered on site, you know, on each of the factory floors, you know, maybe with aggregation point somewhere, uh, and how much of that is really going to be pushed up to the cloud. So now their perspective is like, I don't want to have to deal with the, the, the huge diversity of hardware that I have and bad networks and whatever. I have data points and I want to send that somewhere. And I want someone to make sense of that. And, and so that's, that's interesting because they're coming from industrials, you know, they're at that point right now. Well, and uh, making sense requires a lot of context, right? Yes. And, 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 and then you have different sense that you need. So like, why wouldn't you send it to the cloud? It could be a security thing, right? Yeah. It could be a cost thing. It could be, uh, I don't know, we're some other things we might hear. Like latency. Latency. Yeah. Latency is a problem, yeah. Uh, as you start to think about the like, context of all these things, like, all these things need to be analyzed, yeah. you, that to me then starts to get you to where you can start thinking about agents, right? Um, compliance yeah. is a big one, right? Like any sort of data that is being transferred, like I need to make sure that it's compliant. Well, this is a great use case to build one specific agent for where, hey, these are the compliances that we are held to. Your job agent is only to make sure that this data well, yeah, yeah. It goes here, fits up. Yeah, compliance. yeah, makes sense. Uh, there's this other one that's maybe for like cost and cost and efficiency, right? Like, hey, before you actually process to the cloud, let's make sure that we're we've done the the pre processing, and let's make sure that we've done the cleaning, and we've we've sorted out or made yeah, sense yeah. of it. Uh, that's where you know again these start to become those tools or those agents that you can ultimately start to build and orchestrate a multi agent system, and then. The framework that I start getting people to think about too is like, uh, you know, AGI, AGI, not edge AI, AGI. It, I think it's scary to some people, right? We think Terminator, but like, really think about it more as like a virtual compliance officer, right? Or a, virtu uh, a virtually virtual factory floor assistant. Yeah. Um, then you can work on what are all the things that that person would do in a day, and then sort of really start to identify which of those tasks might actually be a better fit for. AI to handle yeah, yeah. and, and to go back to your like risk model thing, right? It's like, where is there so much data that it, it, it's like hard to handle, but the like risk of, uh, the risk of inaccuracy is low, um, but the value might, might be high. Yeah. And value can be measured by cost. It can be measured by time savings. It can be measured by Interesting. Yeah. Well, that was a good conversation tonight. Too, man. Last yeah. one, right? Like, uh, maybe not. There's some more people waiting. So, like, stay around. We never know, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man.